Hello everyone. Let me welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course The History of English Language and Literature. The objective of today's lecture to, to draw your attention to the transitionary elements from the Augustan age towards the Romantic age. We began to notice in one of the earlier sessions itself that the Augustan age had gone out of fashion, the classical writings had gone out of fashion by the mid 18th century and also there was a growing interest in a more spontaneous and a more natural form of uh, uh, writing. And the following age being the romantic age, it is important for us to delineate the, delineate the ways in which the age began to transcend the uh, classical elements and the 18th century how it paved way to the romantic elements of the 19th century. Even when we began talking about the long 18th century, it was uh, highlighted and it was brought to your attention that it is very difficult to classify this age and uh, talk about it under one particular rubric term. And we noticed that the age, is, the age is known after many influences, it is known as the age of classicism, is known as the age of, uh, uh, known as the Augustan age, it is the age of enlightenment, it is the age of sensibility, it is also named after particular major writers such as the age of Pope or the age of uh, Johnson, it is also the age of the novel. So, given these multiple influences and given these various ways in which the grammar of this uh, particular century has been fashioned, it is very important for us to notice how towards the end of the 18th century, there was an increasing weariness about whatever had dominated the uh, uh, dominated that particular century and also how it uh, began to move towards, uh, uh, it began to move away from whatever had dominated the 18th century. And just like we have noticed in many of the earlier discussions about this transition phase, we always notice that uh, there is always a growing tendency to react against the dominant forms of uh, writing, dominant ideology or even any form of dominant political, uh, political thought. So, in that sense, in the towards the end of the 18th century, we again notice a reactionary kind of writing uh, setting in leading towards a romantic revival. So, this lecture titled the revival of romance, this lecture titled uh, the revival of romance begins by taking a look at a revival of interest in the middle ages which uh, has later come to, know, come to be known as a growing interest in medievalism. This interest in romance and this interest in the middle ages and the fascination about uh, the ancient elements uh, built into it, the primitive elements, the, uh, the magical elements, all of those put together, it began to introduce a new kind of genre itself especially in the later 18th century. And one of the most important figures when we talk about this is Horace Walpole. We have already talked about him in, uh, in the context of other writings. Uh, Horace Walpole was uh, one person who was really fascinated with medieval history and he ev even went to the extent of building a fake gothic castle which he named as Strawberry Hill House. This was initially just a villa that a uh, small cottage that he had uh, uh, he, had, uh, he had got on lease and later he went on to build his own uh, gothic castle uh, which uh, was even recreated as uh, recently as in 2012. So, the first uh, picture is an earlier graphic uh, uh, representation of this strawberry hill house and this was the source of uh, much uh, fascination and much interest for most of the contemporaries of Walpole. And uh, Walpole then took this uh, wonder work of architecture to another level to even composing an entire novel based on this title, The Castle of Otranto, a story. This was published in 1765. This work instantly was then recorded as the first gothic romance in English literary history. So, what were the major elements of gothic romance? This was a form of, uh, uh, this was a recreation of the uh, earlier kinds of uh, medieval romances and the integral part of uh, any kind of gothic romance included ruins, uh, castles, uh, something to do with ancient buildings, about ghosts, the supernatural elements uh, uh, and, and everything which could be related to the medieval times and the uh, uh, romantic stories of those times. So, uh, uh, this particular work, The Castle of Utrando, it was immensely popular and it also uh, got rave reviews from not just the contemporaries, but also from the uh, major writers of the 19th century romantic period. It is uh, said that uh, Gray was so frightened by this uh, mysterious uh, work that he even dreaded to go upstairs to bed and Byron praised this as the first romance in the language. 
uh, taking into account that this was some work which was produced in the 18th century, uh, much after the medieval ages were over and done. And Scott, who was generally always uh, lavish with his praises, he uh, continued to praise Castle of Otrando with a reckless sense of generosity. Owing to the success of Castle of Otrando, it led to a number of imitations and some of the significant ones are being listed here. Uh, Clara Reeve's Old English Baron, published in 1777, was uh, uh, gained much popularity and success as a Gothic story. And Radcliffe went on to write a couple of uh, Gothic romances, including Romance of the Forest, The Mysteries of Udolpho, and The Italian. So, the uh, rumor is that she wrote so many of these Gothic romances with all the supernatural elements built into it that uh, she even went insane in writing them. But however, this is uh, quite an unfounded uh, fact as well. Matthew Gregory Lewis, who wrote Ambrosia or The Monk, also was credited as one of the earliest Gothic writers. When we talk about the 18th century as a transitionary phase, which was something that we also began uh, when we look at the 18th century as a transitionary phase, as we noted in the beginning of this lecture, it is important to notice that uh, towards the end of the 18th century, the Augustan tradition had, uh, had begun to wane away, but it had not completely gone out of fashion. We find a certain sense of a continuation of the Augustan tradition in the writings of Samuel Johnson and in uh, the writings of Oliver Goldsmith. And the historian, uh, the historian Hudson talks about these works as the last great works of the outgoing artificial 18th century school. But though we find a continuance of the tradition in the writings of Johnson and uh, Goldsmith, we also find that there was a, they, they also introduce a kind of rupture from the tradition in certain ways. For example, in their works we notice a treatment of nature and rural life because towards the end of his career, uh, we find Samuel Johnson revising his earlier poem London, which is something that we noticed when we spoke about Johnson. Uh, he revised his poem London and he, uh, he also uh, regrets the fact that in the first edition he had not built in many pastoral elements. So, Johnson's interest in pastoral poetry and in rural life could be seen as a way in which the, he uh, seeks to depart from the dominant tenets of the Augustan tradition. And in, uh, in, in in uh, Goldsmith's writings also we find a certain personal reminiscent uh, form dominating over the uh, dry intellectual wit of the Augustan tradition. If we try to compare the romantic elements of the late 18th century with that of the uh, classical elements which dominated the early 18th century, uh, it is useful to also recall that some of the major elements of classical poetry is something that we had taken a look at in the earlier sessions as well. Uh, classical poetry in general, it was a product of intelligence, it was deficient in emotion and imagination, it was exclusively a town poetry and did not take into consideration the rustic life of uh, England at all. It was uh, found majorly wanting in romantic spirit, it was uh, dry and intellectual and uh, uh, there was no sense of uh, any emotional element in that. We also find that in terms of writing style, it was extremely formal and artificial even to the point of uh, uh, weariness. We also find that in terms of form, it uh, st uh, strictly uh, adhered to the closed couplet form, which was more rigorous than the blank verse, which was prevalent in the previous century. So, compared to the classical form of writing, the romantic, uh, uh, the romantic style of writing had more freedom inherent in it. So, if we compare it uh, with the classical form, we begin to notice that this uh, had more emotion, passion and imagination in poetry. It began to deal with nature and rustic life rather than with uh, the, the life in town. There was a revival of the romantic uh, spirit which was uh, seen severely wanting in the earlier classical writing form. There was also a simplicity of phrase and, uh, and, and a form of uh, shift towards the language of nature. So, in that sense, artificiality was completely abandoned towards the end of the 18th century and we find this uh, replicating in the novel form as well because there were there was a way in which language was coming closer to the, la to the uh, spoken language, the language of the common man than with the language of the learned, uh, learned men and women who were uh, more classical in nature uh, compared to the others. So, uh, in the form of writing, uh, there were continuing changes to be witnessed. Uh, it, it, uh, we find that the romantic writers, they attacked the supremacy of the closed couplet. They also uh, tried, began to adopt other forms, uh, other forms of uh, verses, other forms of writing, including the blank verse, which was more popular in the earlier century.
So, talking about this age as an age of transition, it is important to highlight that there was a struggle between the old and the new, especially from the mid 18th century onwards and we eventually find the triumph of the new. So, in that sense, it was also a struggle between the continuance of the Augustan tradition with the breaking up of the Augustan tradition. And we also find many of the writers registering an open protest against the principles of the reigning uh, Augustan uh, writing principles and the reigning Augustan fashion. For example, Joseph Wharton published an essay on Pope in 1756 where he argued that Pope was a great wit but not a great poet since his, work, uh, since his work lacked those imaginative and emotional qualities which are essential to true poetry. So, we find writers daring to question the Augustan traditions and even the Augustan masters to the extent of rejecting their work uh, from the understanding of poetry itself. Edward Young's Conjectures on Original Composition published in 1759 was, was yet another open protest. Uh, it argued that the poets should leave off imitating classic models and depend upon nature and the promptings of individual genius. So, as we have noted in the earlier uh, in some of the earlier sessions, many other socio-political forces also led to this uh, leveling kind of uh, approach towards literature, towards the classical writings. So, all of this had to eventually lead to a romantic revival, which was primarily visible in terms of a change in form. We find the writers increasingly abandoning the Popian couplet which was more popular in the early 18th century and they all turning to blank verse which a Pope and his contemporaries had much derided. We also find a renewed interest in uh, early writers such as Milton and Spencer. There is particularly a Spencerian revival which dominates the later 18th century. And in Johnson's Rambler, we find a certain uh, record of this. Johnson, Samuel Johnson writes, the imitation of Spencer by the influence of some men of learning and genius seems likely to grow upon the age. Uh, but nevertheless, it is also useful to remember that this movement, this shift towards the Spencerian kind of writing was something that uh, uh, Johnson completely deplored. If you remember, Johnson was extremely critical of the writings of Milton and uh, uh, Spencer and he also thought that uh, they all reeked of a lot of uh, sentimentalism compared to the uh, intellectual dry wet that he was more in appreciation of. So, with the Spencerian revival, we find the English society being uh, taken back to the, uh, the uh, wonder world of chivalry, knight errantry and uh, medieval romance and this was again, it is useful to remember that this was something which was uh, much looked down upon in the early 18th century. So, this uh, Spencerian revival is particularly reflected in some of the writings of those period including William Shenston's The Old, uh, The School Mistress published in 1742, Thomson's A Castle of Indolence and James Beattie's The Minstrel published as a series from 1771 till 74. So, alongside there is also a growing admiration of Milton who had uh, gone quite out of fashion in the early 18th century. Accordingly, we find a series of writers trying to imitate the Miltonic uh, style of writing and also uh, going back to a certain pastoral kind of poetry with a lot of uh, uh, Miltonic uh, grandeur. Uh, in that sense, uh, some of these writers deserve special mentions such as James Thomson's Seasons, uh, Somerville's The Chase. Young's Night Thoughts, Blair's The Grave, John Dyer's The Ruins of Rome and Akinside The Pleasures of uh, the Imagination. So, all of these changes they, uh, they, they were getting affected right from the mid 18th century onwards and we find them rightfully culminating in the romantic movement by the end of the uh, 18th century. And all of those writers, it is uh, some of the common elements deserve special mention. They all had uh, substituted the uh, closed couplet with other loose romantic type of verses, the most dominant one being blank verse. We find all of them stress, stressing on these elements of superiority of the natural and the spontaneous in poetry because this was something which had gone entirely out of fashion, especially in the early 18th century. So, accordingly uh, and, and quite uh, unsurprisingly, there is also a growing love for nature. This was a more like a reaction to the town poetry of the uh, Augustan period and we also find that the poetry begins to gradually move away from the coffee house and from the drawing room where it was limited to particularly in the age of Pope. Hudson uh, uh, talks about this particular shift in these terms. 
nature in its wilder and more rugged aspects shocked the refined taste of a generation which had been trained to prefer the trim garden to the unspoilt hillside. So, as a reaction, romantic poetry, it really had begun to celebrate and appreciate the, uh, appreciate the unspoilt hillside uh, to the trim garden which was more popular in the early Augustan period. So, altogether in multiple ways there is a uh, there is a tendency towards romantic revival through a development of naturalism. That also now uh, forces us to take a look at what naturalism is in simple terms it is uh, a return to nature which was also uh, Rousseau's call uh, to come back to nature and it, al it also had led to the, uh, the, the phenomenal event the French revolution. So, the relationship between all of these uh, political events with, uh, with the romantic revival of the late 18th century is something that we shall come back to again in one of the later sessions. So, what perhaps triggered this naturalism or the return to nature movement in England was a, was a ballad revival which happened towards the end of the 18th century. This was uh, quite despite the, uh, the ridicule that Samuel Johnson had uh, against uh, uh, ballads during the 18th century because he did not find them uh, acceptable in any form because he thought they were uh, too trivial to even be considered as a literature. And uh, uh, alongside the ballad revival there is a tendency to move towards simplicity and they also most of the major poets and the major writers of those uh, times they began to also reject the carefully cultivated conventional mannerisms of the Augustan age. For example, uh, if you recall in one of the earlier sessions we had uh, spoken about the way in which the, uh, the Augustan writers sought to improve and refine language uh, so that it became not just refined but also more complicated to the common man's understanding. For example, a popular phrase from one of the ballads, God rest his soul, it was improved and refined to eternal blessings on his shade attend. So, these sort of refinement on the language was no longer found acceptable towards the end of the 18th century because this kind of, uh, this kind of overt influence on the intellectualism and the overt influence on the uh, superiority of uh, artificial language it was a much, it, it began to be much derided towards the end of the 18th century. So, with this the time was quite ripe for the romantic revival to completely uh, sweep over all of the uh, literary traditions of those times and also uh, we find that the romanticism begins to dominate the 19th century. So, in the next session we shall continue to look at the various uh, forms of writings and the various writers who encourage this form of naturalism in their writings and how the transition effectively took place through this form of natural expressions in language. So, with this we also begin to wrap up today's lecture in anticipation of uh, the next lecture which, which shall be taking a closer look at what exactly the romantic movement was. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.